general blockchain, and I would li like to invite Mr. Rami Efrati, come please to the stage. He is a founder and the president of Firmer Cybersecurity Solution Company, and he will introduce and call the rest of the panelists. So Rami, please come to the stage and invite them. Thank you, Rami. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming. I would like, first of all, to thank both Professor Yitzhak Ben Israel and Gili for uh, honoring me to uh, moderate this uh, important uh, panel. Blockchain is not only uh, fintech. Blockchain is also non-fintech business. And we're going to speak today about the non-fintech applications. My name is Rami Frati. I'm also the former head of the civilian sector division at the uh, National Cyber Bureau. I'm an entrepreneur, not yet in fintech, but probably uh, soon. Uh, before uh, coming to this uh, panel, I just got a very important uh, message from uh, my wife, an SMS, a texting. It's not about the Mondial, it's that she's watching me, so be nice to me and I will be nice to you as well. And I uh, read uh, a special uh, article coming from uh, Ellen Mespropian from the Medici, and I would like just to quote two things from there about the 21 applications that she found on a non uh, uh, on a known uh, fintech uh, blockchain. Despite mostly financial related interest in blockchain technology, the areas of distributed ledger technology, which we call the DLT application, are not limited to the financial services industry. Along with banks and fintech startups, non financial players have been paying attention and looked for ways to leverage the opportunities that DLT opens. Even the NIST. The National Institute for Science and Technology in the United States just came with a draft, which called NIST IR8202, uh, which is announcing the release of a blockchain technology overview, which I believe all of us will have to uh, look uh, quickly while we will deal with this issue. And since we are also in Israel, I'm proud to say that according to the um, Export uh, Institute, my Oren Otni, uh, if we compare the numbers of companies dealing with non-fintech uh, and fintech uh, uh, business, we are speaking about 90 companies which are dealing with blockchain in healthcare, in finance, in uh, infrastructure, etc., and it is well adopted. We have with us a very special panel of experts uh, who will uh, enrich us uh, very soon, uh, both from uh, all over the world and also from uh, Israel. I will try as much as I can not to ask too many questions by myself, I would like if I, there will be time also that you will take a part, so prepare your questions. Uh, the first one that I would like to present is Professor Yuval Shavit. He is Professor, uh, Yuval, please come here. He is a professor of electrical engineering in Tel Aviv University. He worked for uh, four years as uh, a network center for Bell Labs. And in 2004, he incepted the DIMES project uh, for mapping the internet uh, infrastructure. Thank you for coming. Gideon Lichtfeld. Mr. Gideon Lichtfeld is the editor-in-chief of MIT Technology Review, a general uh, uh, publication covering uh, all range of engineering technology. Gideon, thank you for coming. Uh, and we have also with us uh, uh, Mr. Ras Dietz. He is the VP Chief Security Officer and General Manager of Industrial Internet Cybersecurity, GE Digital. Where is Ras? He's coming, please. And uh, the last one is uh, Steve Bassi. He's the CEO of uh, Poliswarm, uh, the first uh, uh, decentralized marketplace for threat intelligence and innovative blockchain cybersecurity startup that recently raised $26 million uh, in funding. NARF uh, Industries awarded by Department of uh, Homeland Security USA. And since uh, I believe that uh, most of you are already sitting. I would like to start with a question to uh, Professor uh, Shavit, and then I will go all over. I'm not going to ask all of you all the questions, but please, if you have something that you would like to uh, comment, please do it, because I prefer that the audience will have the chance to, uh, to ask questions as well. Uh, is it uh, very important? Uh, Yuval, I would like to ask you, how do you vision the race between public and private blockchain ecosystems? What do you think about it? This thing that, okay, hi. So um, the way I see it is uh, 
there's a real problem with uh, uh, public blockchain infrastructures. My company is, is following from security viewpoint uh, blockchain uh, infrastructures and there is a vast majority of the nodes spread in locations you don't want your traffic to be there, you don't want your data to be there, your cryptocurrency to be there. So I think that in reality, uh, private blockchain infrastructure are more likely to, to win the race and be able to give services to companies or more to uh, aggregation of companies working together with distributed ledger. Great. Gidon, I see that you would like to comment as well. So I just want to clarify, when you say a public blockchain versus private, do you mean a permissionless blockchain versus a permissioned one, or do you mean, yes. do you mean public pri versus private? When I say private, I mean that there's a, a, a closed list. Yeah, permission. Okay, but still visible to the outside Still world. visible to the outside, yes. All right. That was all. Okay, I'm going on with uh, my questions. What do we think are the potentially most interesting non-fintech applications since this is our, for blockchain, since this is our main panel issue? Uh, maybe, uh, Steve? Yeah, so I think anything that um, relates to tracking reputation or performance over long periods of time uh, that's not necessarily financially regulated. Um, in, in our example, we look at how security experts detect malware and other threats over time, and we've never really done that for the past 20 years of, say, antivirus or some of the other um, you know, software protection mechanisms out there. So that, for me, that's a compelling application. Uh, I think other things that track things like uh, solar energy production or um, how certain areas of the world have performed in energy production and economics or whatever is also interesting because you have a, a much better basis for statistics that can't be manipulated in the long run. Russ, I suggest that you will comment as well. <laughs> there we go. Okay, yeah, I, I would agree. Reputation um, for long-lived uh, elements is absolutely going to be a, a significant area. Um, when you look in uh, industrial IoT, um, when you look at the, uh, the chain of custody of, uh, of systems, um, they go through uh, a dramatic number of uh, different channels uh, through deployment and through lifecycle management. Um, and in addition to that, uh, the assets are long-lived. Um, uh, so, in order to, uh, to, to basically make sure that the reputation of either the manufacturer or the deployer um, uh, or the, the manager of the device, so those things are going to become, um, you know, vital parts of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of the use of uh, these kinds of uh, private uh, blockchains. We definitely see that. Um, also, uh, again, reputation of long-lived software is, is going to be another element uh, uh, in the chain of industrial elements um, for industrial IoT. Uh, and then, again, reputation of, uh, of information assets relative to industrial systems, same thing, uh, because there's a lot of long-lived uh, historical information that's used um, uh, for evaluating uh, either consumption, um, you name it, weather data, uh, or even uh, the production and performance information relevant to it. So th that's why we see a tremendous amount of, uh, of possibility uh, in, uh, in the industrial uh, digitalization uh, areas for sure. I guess my, my question to you both is what makes a blockchain a better solution in those situations than just any other secure database? It's not always a better solution in those situations, right? It's, it's very application specific. So if you're talking something that, you know, um, you're going to have to scale in ICS devices, for example, right? You're talking about, you know, over a lifetime, terabytes and terabytes of data out of these devices. And then you're expecting to store a copy of that terabyte of data on every single device. That's not going to work for your particular application, right? So where's the storage out? How do you summarize that storage? Which specific blockchain chain implementation are you using, right? Like these are all good application-specific engineering questions. So my first, even though we use it in our application when everybody says, you know, uh, why don't you add a blockchain feature to that? I'm like, are you just saying that because it's a buzzword or do you have an actual reason to answer your question? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's very true. Look, this is, uh, last year uh, when I was on the panel uh, on this exact same topic, I said, this is, I said the same thing. I said basically, you know, uh, blockchain will cure cancer. Um, so, uh, so I, 
I completely agree with ever with the question of why not, you know, or why something else. Um, I think uh, uh, in this particular case, um, it's uh, the separation of the data asset, potentially having the data assets somewhere else, um, uh, and then being able to um, uh, to, to to leverage uh, blockchain for the contracts, or actually for the migration and reuse of the information. There are certain ways that I can see that it would be valuable in those in those scenarios. Um, if you think about industrial data or things that data sets that industrial assets and capabilities consume. There's a, how do I say this, a librarian effect, kind of a trusted librarian effect that where I can see a blockchain may make it simpler to deploy and lifecycle manage. Uh, but as Omar pointed out in his presentation, there are still challenges, okay? Um, especially concerned about scalability. So uh, the way I see it is there gonna be some sweet spot. Uh, we already saw in the previous panel that Blockchain is not up to the challenge for very, very large applications. And when it's too small, it doesn't make sense to use it from the economical point of view. So there should be some good spot in the middle where, especially when you have multi-party settlements between hundreds or maybe thousands of companies, where the cost of, of running all the separate ledgers in the back office is just too expensive. And if you have a, a, a public ledger, with the cost of maintaining is still smaller than all the back offices of all the companies together. On, on a lot of these, I feel like I'm the one answering, asking the questions now, but anyway. Um, it, because on a lot of these applications, the pro, there is a problem with it being a public ledger. I mean, if you want it to be, for instance, supply chain management, it can't be public, or maybe it can in certain cases, but what are the, uh, how, do you, how do you overcome that problem? Since I've seen that you have uh, warmed up so quickly, let's go on directly to the second question, which I believe is following up the first one. Which applications are we skeptical about or are most overhyped? There you go. <laughs> Anything that requires a public ledger when you want the information to be private. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. When you want information to be private, um, again, we'll go back to Omar's presentation. He's like layering a whole mess of different technology uh, in order to actually get what we want squeezed into a blockchain? And the answer is, is it really worth it? Um, so I would agree. I don't, I don't know that in a public, you know, in a public blockchain uh, that, that, that uh, we're gonna be seeing you know, um, uh, something that, uh, that makes sense. Um, I will say, like I said, in some cases, the biggest thing I'm getting at is more of a librarian concept. The information is available publicly, nobody cares that it is, but they need to be able to, um, uh, to have some non-repudiation in, uh, in who it is they've consumed it from. There are other ways to do this, of course, right now. Um, so that's one example. I, and again, I see lots of librarian with trust kinds of things. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting is small private blockchains. Um, they make it a little bit easier to deal with attestation uh, in, a, in a stack of services. Um, and, and that does you know, solve some problems for us. Um, you know, a device like, I'll give you another good example, sensors uh, that, are collect, that come together um, in an edge controller um, in an industrial application. It's not gonna be a lot of of subscriptions or enrollments in uh, in that contract, the contract would get you know um, generated at a time that the device is brought online, and then you know the chain would only be can, uh, something that would be uh, used to you know uh, validate and prove um, from the device's standpoint or from someone consuming information that the integrity of the ch uh, of the chain kept you know all the sensors in good check. But I do agree with you; those are small right applications, small uh, chains. So after we spoke about uh, the potentially most interesting non-fintech, after we spoke about the skeptical, let's go on and see what are the biggest obstacles to adopt blockchain tech in the areas we have mentioned as promising ones. Who would like to start? Steve, please. Yeah, I think um, upgradability of aspects of the chain over the long term. And what I mean by that is, is currently, let's take Ethereum smart contracts, for example, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there, was a, there was a big uh, issue, I don't know, a few months back where uh, someone found a way to kill a smart contract that, has, that was a library contract. Other people relied on that contract 
to essentially move money or funds around. The net result was about 90 million at the time, US, and Ether was locked up, right? So this idea of how do we keep a long-lived system around and upgrade things like smart contracts while still providing strong guarantees about people not being able to edit history or damage the system. Because let's remember things like Bitcoin or Ethereum or some of the smart contracts on there, they have a very, very large bug bounty placed on them on the orders of hundreds of millions, tens of millions of dollars. So any one flaw, the longer that contract is out there, if a flaw is in there, the more likely it is to be exposed with time. So this sort of permanence and the ability to analyze it in the public space is a challenge, I think. Thank you. you Professor Shavit, please. So I have a very short answer, two words, cost and security. I think both are underappreciated. Both are underappreciated. Under. Say more. I think people do, don't really understand the challenges uh, in uh, securing a blockchain. Uh, we look at uh, partition attack, for example, which are so easy to obtain in the current internet. So, uh, Partition attack, for example, are so easy to do. There was a study uh, that showed uh, that for a potential attacker, it's very, uh, very easy to partition a network. And we don't have a good answer right now. Yeah. I mean, I, a lot of people seem to talk about blockchain for supply chain management. And I was on a panel a, few, a couple of months ago where Walmart and Maersk, the shipping company, we're talking about how they're working to use a blockchain to track the supply chains of, for instance, I don't know, bananas or lettuce or you know, foodstuffs all the way from the supplier through the shipping chain and to the supermarket shelf. And this makes it easier for them to, for instance, find out if, you know, if people got sick from some shipment of lettuce, they can find out which farm the lettuce came from, that kind of thing. And it was hard for them to explain exactly why a blockchain was better for this, as it often is. Um, <clears throat> but it, se it seemed to me that merely the fact that these big companies were investing in it was almost in itself enough to create the critical mass. In other words, the blockchain might not necessarily be a better solution, but if it was an adequate solution, and if companies like that started implementing it, it would start to gradually become, maybe start to gradually become a de facto standard. And that would, that would overcome the adoption obstacle. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, 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 I want to lean in where, where Gideon's going. I, that's what's interesting to me, is, is the fact is, is that it potential, it, the potential for a de facto standard in some of these areas is high, um, and the potential to deal with all of the possible ramifications and issues is high because of the amount of technology investment. Um, I, so that's what's interesting to me, um, and, and, and I agree. I have yet to see more than a handful of non-fintech applications where I've actually sat down and whiteboarded it and gone through it and said, okay, the blockchain is okay, but I could probably come up with other ideas, but it still looks like it's slightly better than what I can do over here. Um, uh, but with so much focus and research, and funding, uh, and the potential for de facto standards, it's, it's the possibility of it becoming something everybody jumps into in that implementation you know, makes a lot of sense. Right, and that's essentially because the big companies don't want to be left behind. They don't want to run the risk of being left behind, so they push the projects forward. I, I've got another way of thinking of it. I, th I think that the implementation is obviously different than this, but it has this sort of public square, public ledger quality, right? Where everybody feels it's, a, it's sort of a, a common, a, a public common, where they can write to it and it's this external party and, and no one person controls it. When in reality, they still keep a digital copy on their own servers, they all connect to each other anyway. It's really no different than a centralized database and function, but it, it's a feeling, it feels different. It feels shared and not controlled by any one party. And I think that's some of the reason why it feels different than coming up with a traditional standard in a centralized repository somewhere. Right. And that, so I'm curious then about your opinion about, there, there's a project that a guy called Julius Akinyemi 
is doing, uh, he has a company I think called Uwin Corp. Anyway, they are creating a kind, a kind of commons. It's a digital blockchain-based commodity trading market. And the idea is, and it, and it also act, has the added benefit of acting as a kind of asset registry. So the idea is poor countries, they're doing a pilot in Cameroon, another one in Senegal, I think, or Mauritius. Uh, and the idea is they get farmers to register their assets on this blockchain, and then it also acts as a, as a trading platform. Um, the assets, therefore, are supposedly verifiable. You can trade with people at a distance, and all, everybody's assets get registered, which is you know, good for the country and for the economy. Now, I, so I, there's, I can see a sort of an argument there of why a, a very big distributed system would make sense, and then if it does, so does it make sense, and then how, what's the way to get adoption there? I suppose it's just by creating trust. Yeah, the, the question there is how, from a security standpoint, how do you link that real-world asset, that real-world transaction with, you know, the chain? Like, this is That's the That's basically mile. the question with almost yeah. every implementation, yes. right? Yeah. And this is, of course, going to bring us to the question how we are going to regulate blockchain. Uh, if you remember, when I started the presentation, I spoke about the draft coming just now from uh, NIST 8202 about it, but I'm sure that you have your ideas as well. So maybe, Steve, you will start about it. I don't, I don't get into regulation discussions. So I'm just, no, I, As a businessman, you don't like it. I, no, I, I, I just, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that I have much value to add because it's all about creating, you know, the valuable case there. That what's the valuable thing to be regulated, right? And then let's understand where it breaks down, right? We have this already in securities regulation in the U.S. Yes. You know, a bunch of people got scammed in the 20s and 30s, so we put in, in place what we thought were common sense regulations at the time. A lot of them actually still work really well, but you know they need to be updated for the modern world. So I'm, I'm a big fan of sort of build before you regulate, to be honest. Yeah, and, 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 uh, and I think where, where Steve is going is exactly, and make sure you have your use cases. I think the regulators are nervous, right, because they see all of the, fin, the, all the FinTech stuff going on and they're like, oh my gosh, the world is going to come to an end or something bizarre is going to happen or we're going to lose access to funds or they don't know what it is. Um, but I don't think there's enough use cases yet out there because I would think the regulations would not be technology oriented, they'd be use case oriented and then add the technology as a subsection to the regulation. That would be the way I'd look at it. You done? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I agree. It's. It, we're starting to see regulation just on the question of is a, is a token a security? And that's the, the question in the US and it's a uh, question in several other countries. And that is exactly a response to essentially chaos. And, and it's a reasonable regulatory response to avoid people getting scammed. Um, but beyond that, I mean, I, I also, I'm trying to think what, what is it that you would actually need to regulate? I mean, maybe to bring back the question that you asked, Steve, is if, if one of the issues of using a blockchain for trading or for a supply chain is how do you know that the assets were correctly recorded on the blockchain? Does that need to be regulated? Maybe it already is regulated. Maybe there's a law that says you can't fraudulently, fraudulently record an asset in a ledger, but would that need to be regulated? I don't know. So there's like an impedance mismatch there, right? It's, it's this idea that Okay, so we registered our, our bushel of corn on the on the blockchain, right? And then, right. Uh, but it was actually a bushel of cocaine. We just okay, didn't tell yeah, anybody. Yeah. It was right. a bush, uh, more exciting. I like that. Um, you know, then my goat ate it, right? So, <laughs> how do you reverse this immutable record of of you know this asset disappearing in a fire or flood or whatever, right? What's the regulation behind that? And then, who gets to write that that record back into the chain that says? you know, this is, this is gone, and don't we just end up in the same place we do with government corruption just technologically enabled now, right? Right, exactly. In, in the third world case, obviously. What does academia think about it? I think that obviously regulation should not be about technology. Okay. Yeah, so regulation should not be about technology, but, but about the management of technology. So, you know, it, it shouldn't tell you how to run your blockchain, but, you know, what data what logs you should keep that are outside of the world of the world chain that enable you to find problems. For, for example, you might need to log communication to nodes that run your blockchain 
that are it's related to, to whatever the blockchain is doing, just so you can do forensic uh, about uh, criminal events, hacking, hacking events. And, and in general, in order to make this whole thing credible, you need to, to be able to run a certain type of uh, uh, processes that will, will make sure that what you're doing is the most secure way both currently and for the future. And mainly, I mean, in collecting more and more information for being analyzed by researchers. Yeah, I think in the end, what the regulators are doing to, to go exactly in that direction is they're looking at um, un the unfortunate assumption that uh, because blockchain started off by working with, with uh, the cashless funding world, the concern they have is, how did the trust behind the chain get established? So they're looking for ways to, and you guys are covering some of this, create that. But, but that goes back to the use case, right? Is it really a security issue? Is it really, is it what is the issue? It's, in, at the, in the end, what it is, is the regulator saying, for some reason, people assume trust in this blockchain. And we're saying uh, we're concerned about that trust, and I agree, that's what we're hearing here, um, because we don't know how to reverse it, or we don't know what to do about it if it's not trustworthy. So, so again, I think it's less about, again, the technology, and it's more around the hype of the implementation of the technology. Great, so if this is the situation, how can we harness blockchain alongside the emergent technology convergence for a societal impact? What do you think about it, Gideon? Maybe you start. Sorry, the question was how to harness blockchain for? Uh, for societal impact. For societal impact. I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, a, an example like the one that I mentioned of this attempt to create a trading, a farmer's trading market, potentially that could have great impact if, if people adopt it, if it leads to more trade and more, more commerce. I hear a lot of people you talking about applications like this, it always comes back to the same, the same questions we've been discussing. How do you make it secure? How do you establish trust in the system? How do you ensure that the interface between the blockchain and the real world is also trustworthy? You know, there's another project that, um, that we wrote about in Technology Review, not to do advertising, uh, that is about uh, a refugee camp in Jordan for Syrian refugees. And people show up at this camp, they often, they lost everything. They have no papers, they have nothing to establish their identity, their credentials. Um, they have no form of, you know, no bank account. So it's a collaboration with the UN uh, World Food Program, I think. And what they do is they assign you essentially a blockchain-based identity, which also functions as your digital wallet for currency, which you can use so the UN gives you uh, food aid into your digital wallet. You can use that at the camp supermarket to buy food. And then, in theory, on this digital wallet, they will also record other things like your identity, like, uh, I don't know, credentials, training courses you took, maybe. And then when you eventually leave the camp, you'll be able to go into the real world and you'll have this thing with you that lives on your mobile phone um, and allows you to establish who you are and what you own and what you have done. It, again, it sounds like a wonderful, a wonderful idea. Maybe, maybe it will take, I don't know. The question here yeah. is, who, who is paying for this? Who is crunching the numbers? Who and is crunching the numbers for this for particular? The, for this particular application. Mm. And if there are just, you know, if the UN is crunching the number, we moved from a distributed application to, again, a central application because the yes. UN is controlling the blockchain. Exactly, so it is still a centralized, centrally controlled, private blockchain and their you know their rationale for doing it is they say it can it can increase efficiency or reduce the possibility of government corruption because f funds f it's harder for funds to be diverted that's their number crunching but yes you're 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 right it's but if the un is running at everything the un can just buy a big ibm machine and do the same centrally you don't need to do it with blockchain right you lose the distribution nature of the application exactly yeah, I mean, uh, this is a, it's an interesting challenge because it's just reminding me of the several things that I've looked at uh, recently where, unfortunately, eventually they have to go centralized. Um, I'll give you a good example. Uh, you know, um, there's a huge issue uh, with particular types of cars out there right now 
that are of high value. Um, they're in accidents, they have a lot of leftover parts, but the manufacturer doesn't want those parts used because it can't trust them, okay? So they require the, these, the, uh, uh, the actual um, uh, body shops to, co to come to them to buy parts. So I saw this interesting creative, well, you know, we're gonna create this you know, blockchain of used parts, they'll go back through some system and this manufacturer will authorize the fact that yes, this part is one of theirs, they did, and I said, okay, stop right there, right? You just went to a central system again. And um, so that's been the issue that I've been running into is every one of these, eventually you can distribute them and it's an interesting challenge or they start off distributed. There's somebody coming back and putting their trust fingerprint on it. And once they do that, they might as well manage it um, because the cost to manage it isn't that complicated. So, so it's a, it, I'm finding more and more of these, they fail the, central, the decentralization test. Right. So there are applications where you would really want it to be decentralized. So an example that people talk about is blockchain-based voting in a country where the institutions of voting are not very secure. So you want to try to create a system where somehow or other civil society actors are also part of the distributed ledger framework so that nobody can dis tamper with the results. Right. Uh, again, I think this... I don't know if this has been successfully used. I don't think it's been successfully adopted anyway yet. Yeah, not that I, but I've heard it too, but I haven't seen it. Steve, what I do you think, think about it? Oh, just sorry. one quick no, no, no. Uh, I just think uh, okay. decentralized, if we haven't gotten like regular voting machines right, I'm not sure that blockchain-based voting is gonna be a... That's, that's only in America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure that, uh, I think the ink on the fingers thing still works the best for, for double voting. Um, I, I don't think the, um, you know, we have this the whole thing with ballot privacy too, right? With ballot, ballot privacy. Privacy, right? you know, one real good way to, um, uh, to stymie opposition is to figure out how they voted and go, you know, put them in a camp somewhere, right? That's, um, I, uh, so I, uh, there's dangers with it. Like this confidentiality piece on blockchain is like a really hard problem because if a key is ever compromised and therefore the confidentiality of a record is ever compromised, it's done forever, right? You can't pull the original data out of a source and re-encrypt it or anything. Um, so I, I have a lot of trouble with figuring out how we put long-lived data on a chain that we never want to be public. Yuval, please. So I think we should be very careful in using blockchain for things it is not well adapted for. Uh, the networking world have seen it many, many times in the past. You need uh, to use blockchain in places that you have many, many parties that need to do something together. Whenever you can go central, it's always the easiest, the cheapest, and the best solution. We've seen this in the networking world happening again and again. You know, peer-to-peer -peer applications were thought to be the thing, and the only thing they were good for is to avoid uh, the fate of uh, Napster, which was shot by law. So it's, it was only good for stealing. There was no real advantage in running a central server for downloading music. Yeah, so I guess, I guess the criteria is where in, where in transactional humanity do we always cheat each other unless someone else is watching, right? Like that's the, the distilled quality of where a blockchain might be applicable for social good. Right. Well, coming soon to the end of our uh, panel, I still have another question, but I'm asking you, the audience, if you will have one question, I think we won't have uh, time for more. And remember, we're speaking about the non-fintech blockchain. Please prepare it. But I'm going to ask the panel, uh, uh, the last question is, uh, how do you vision the race between public and private blockchain ecosystem? Who would like to start? Gidon, I think you are the one. I think you've already answered this, right? Uh, <laughs> yes, but I want you to hear you. I mean, well. I... Uh... I suppose I feel like it comes back to what we've just been discussing. If it's a private blockchain, it tends to be a not very distributed blockchain, and then there's what's the point in there being a blockchain? So I feel as if, and I think maybe I'm contradicting you, Val, here, but I, my, my sense is that the applications that can really probably be called blockchain applications will have to be public ones. Uh, I don't see in the private cases where you would, where there would be a case for, for a blockchain as opposed to just a, a centralized system. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, that, uh, that's exactly it. And I, it's interesting to watch uh, this same debate uh, in the fintech space right now <laughs> because of where Steve was going. Um, the, world, uh, the world is proving that somebody has got to look over your shoulder. So now all of a sudden, okay, if someone's going to look over my shoulder, then is, uh, does that mean that, you know, the, 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 the chain can, you know, be permissionless? And I think the answer is probably not, okay? So, so it's, a, it's, it's an interesting, um, you know, situation that we're having between the public-private race and the fact that the use cases, um, you know, uh, 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 tend to conflict with, uh, with which one we think would, uh, would move forward. My, my problem with public blockchain is, one, who is paying for this? And two, how do we avoid a situation where the majority of the calculation is done in places you don't want your data to be in? China, Indonesia, Russia, and places like this. Who is paying for it is an excellent question. It works with a cryptocurrency where there is an incentive for people to mine. I'm not clear what it is with other applications. Um, but m maybe there will be some ingenuity. On the where your data is stored, though, I'm, I'm not sure I, I see the problem necessarily because the whole, the whole point of it is that the information on the blockchain is public. So it doesn't matter who, who has it, and multiple copies of it exist everywhere anyway. It, I, to counterpoint to that, I think it does matter if um, people can't participate because the cost to store all the information, have a copy, and verify is too high for them to participate. So this is perfect with the, the mobile device only in the developing world versus powerful computers well connected to a power supply in the first world. And we're seeing it now. You can't run a full Ethereum node, for example, on a mobile phone. Just not possible. So yes, but with caveats. Right, I see. So you're, say, you're saying the problem of it is that it would end up being confined to certain countries, so it, would, would, it wouldn't achieve the kind of distribution that you want anyway? Yeah, at the moment I think that's, that's true. But, you know, maybe Moore's Law will catch up and prove me wrong. I was very happy, by the way, by the question coming from the academia for Professor Shafit, who is going to pay for it. Is it the first time I hear the academia asking about how much money, but it means that you are also a businessman. As long as we get funding, everything is okay. That's right. So before we are wrapping up, uh, do we have any question from the audience? Yes, we have one. Let's do it a short one, please. And if we can have lights, so we'll see you. Thank you very much. Can you recognize yourself? Yes, uh, my name is uh, Giti. אני אשאל קודם את השאלה בעברית, כי יותר קל לי בעברית. אנחנו יודעים שבישראל יש מהממשלה מנסה להגביל את השימוש במזומן בשנים האחרונות. I see a dystopian future. I see that these virtual coins are becoming a, a state of the art in the, for governments, for dictators. I see a danger in it. Uh, I wondered what you think about it, that we, we are all like, for example, you said about China, that many people, uh, he said from Intel, that so many people in China are, are using uh, this uh, wallet. Um, I wonder what you think about dictators that might use this technology f to uh, control uh, their citizens. There's no problem uh, to, to charge uh, taxes, nothing, uh, everything is virtual. What do you think about some kind of dystopian future? Thank you very much. So it's, it's a wide question. So wide, I mean, technology yeah. can always be used for good and bad. But in, in the specific case you said about uh, moving away from uh, cash to, uh, let's say, contract or, or registered transactions, this, is, this has very uh, 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 good uh, aspects because it's avoid black economy. And you know, in, in the West, black economy is estimated anywhere between 15 and 25%. We're talking about huge amount of money that is not taxable. On the other hand, of course, it's, it, it violates your privacy because everything you do, every transaction is now recorded. So there's a balance here. 
Anybody else would like to answer? If not, then uh, last question, please, from the audience. So everything is uh, clear, but okay, we have one question, please. Just, just a second, please. In fintech and in non-fintech applications, scalability has frequently been cited as a main issue. Um, there are some possible solutions proposed by Professor Adam earlier, and IOTA has been referenced as well. I understand that it's very much dependent on specific applications, what you guys might see as some sort of solution, but I was wondering what sort of things seem most probable or likely moving forward in order to solve this uh, issue of scalability. Russ, you're the guy. Uh, I was going to say, so scalability, again, uh, the, the, I, the proposals that were made, yep, okay, but again, I'm going to go to the application itself. So as you saw even in, in Omar's presentation, the last one, the scale has, has a direct issue related to the application and what the, and what the problem may be. So it's, I wouldn't go and say, oh, all applications have a scaling issue. Um, uh, and, and I'm also not that concerned about scale, just it's a problem now uh, for some use cases, okay? Uh, but, but, at the, but in the end, I, I believe that that gap will get closed anyway. Um, so again, in each of those examples, scale is purely, uh, what, I, what I think is a, is a good proof point that Omar was showing is, if your use case doesn't check all of your boxes, then don't do it right now, okay? I mean, that's basically it. Um, and if you're trying to do it, let's make sure you're trying to actually use blockchains in a place where they're the only reason that, that they're a good reason to solve the problem. Uh, let's not try and solve scale and say, okay, we did it. And that's what I'm concerned about when I see what's going on because I, I don't see that those applications require the use of blockchain technology uh, for them to be successful. Great. Uh, thank you very much. We came uh, exactly uh, to our uh, finalizing uh, time uh, because time is over. I take this opportunity, first of all, to thank very much the uh, amazing panelists, Professor Yuval Shavit, wake up. <laughs> Professor Yuval Shavit from the Electrical Engineering in Tel Aviv University, Mr. Gideon Lichtfeld, Editor-in-Chief, MIT Technology Review, Raz Dietz, uh, VP Chief Security Officer and GM at uh, General Electric, Steve Bassi, CEO of uh, Poliswarm. I would like also to thank you for being here and special thanks to uh, Gilly Drove and Professor Ben Israel who arranged this excellent Cyber Week. They really should get your applauses for that. And the last one, Mr. Marian Block, without him, I wouldn't be able to be here and do this important mission. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the